and I looked, and behold, the heavens were opened. A ninth season. <laughs> we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the five solas. We believe in the doctrines of grace. A lot of the time, people are asking the wrong questions. They're not asking the questions like, do I understand God's grace? Do I understand the cross? Every single one of us has our own ministry. It doesn't matter if you work as a CEO or you work at McDonald's or whatever you do, or whether you're quote unquote in ministry, you have a ministry. As we mature, we walk, we, we enjoy our relationship with God in as much as we see his majesty in the blessings that we have just by what Yeshua has done for us, not by what we have done to impress God and then get something from him. So faith, but, so, so salvation by faith. Absolutely. Salvation by faith. I keep zeroing in on these, you know, the big ideas, like what is biblical love? You know, what is, what is grace? Do I have an accurate understanding of God's grace? Our love for Yeshua, but his love, like through us is why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why it's called Messiah Matters. Wednesday, July 13th, 2022. This is Messiah Matters number 392. Back in the cockpit, my name is Caleb Hag. And hoping that next year's intro music, or whenever Caleb does new music, that it still contains a, a baritone saxophone. I'm Rob Vanoff. Oh, it will. Don't you worry. The baritone there sax is. is the only sax that I can get behind. No offense. Dude, it's just, it just hits that. right. Yeah, it, it moves your whole your your whole torso like moves with that thing. Yep. All right, we're back, man. It's been two whole weeks. Caleb, Do you okay, have a good two a weeks. Musical question: Does Uh-oh. what's the 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 octave or the frequency range of a cello against a berry? Does the berry go deeper? I don't. Does know, a berry man. have a lower note than a cello? Can I just tell you something? Like in symphony, the anyone who played br- it was like brass against strings. You know what I mean? Like the wind and yeah, the brass, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like and and then they would get together and they'd have their their brass uh, orchestra or whatever, and it sounded so good. And we just hated that. We hated that they sounded so good. You know, never the two were gonna meet. <clears throat> my uh, my good friend uh, Jeff Young. I was showing him the about us page on, uh, or about page on, uh, the new site that I just launched pronomian.com. And, uh, my wife is the one who edited that page and, uh, I left it as is, uh, she said, you know, there needs to be some humor on this site somewhere to let people know that you're a normal person. And so, uh, she wrote it, but I was showing my good friend Jeff that, and he said, I didn't know that you played the cello. So that just shows how much he watches this show. <laughs> uh, what I want to hear someday, plug your cello into like an awesome, like distortion pedal, maybe a little bit of chorus, chorus or flange, a little bit of echo. And I want to hear you play 
the Hoff goes off theme. All right. I'll have to go into the storage and get all my, uh, my pedals. It's highly out. chromatic. It's like this metallic esque yep. <laughs> chromatic. Yes, <riff. laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. So, uh, we have had two weeks off. What'd you do in two weeks, man? What did you do in two weeks? Oh, my body's so sore right now. Mine too, but probably for different reasons. Digging holes, moving heavy things. Yeah. Climbing ladders and and sawing on limbs. You know, that sounds not fun. So I'm happy that my- Dealing my with, with outrageous, uh, like, ras- I think they're like raspberry bushes, but they don't produce any raspberries, but they're like nasty thorns. I mean, I you probably can't see, but oh, like they see, catch yeah. and then it tears. Not you know, fun, it's, it's Not all, fun. it's, it's good stuff. It's being out, but it reminds me the whole time. I'm like thinking of like Genesis three. I'm like, it will bring thorns and thistles <laughs> up for you. The sweat of your brow. Oh, Adam, why did you sin? <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. All right. Well, Hey, before we go on, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's tell people how to get a hold of us. And by the way, the producer credits that just came up are not the full credits. I created the, uh, the lower third is what we call that thing that comes up on the uh, screen with all of our, uh, uh, producers on it. However, uh, I forgot before we came on air, there's been some technical issues this morning and I apologize that, uh, we're, I'm in a, I'm in a state of kind of disarray. As of late. Yeah. Oh, well. All around, man. But uh, I, I apologize to our new producers. There are two producers that uh, should be on that that aren't. They will be on there next week, and I do apologize. I'll try to get that up. Um, I'll try to get their names on the clipped videos as well. All right. Uh, but until that time comes, if you want to be a part of this conversation, you can do so. 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. You can also shoot us an email. Seaheg at ToriResource.com, C-H-E-G-G at ToriResource.com. We got an interesting uh, message this last week in our inbox on the Facebook page of Messiah Matters. And, uh, you know, I created a, uh, a Facebook group for, um, for Pronomian.com, and it's done fairly well. Uh, I don't know if people want to talk about this show or not, but maybe we should set something up like that. Anyway, this person said in the message uh, on Facebook, uh, would you be willing to Rob? I think it was directed at Rob. I don't know if you saw this or not. Would you be willing to ever teach some classes? And uh, I just kind of chuckled to myself. I, I wrote back. But anyway, if you don't already know, Torah Resource is the place that uh, Rob and I both work. Torah Resource Institute is the school associated with Torah Resource. And if you want to take classes from Rob, you can do so. Uh, classes will start in September. Uh, you can September Google 6th. It. Yeah, September sixth, I believe, is the uh, is the uh, next kickoff date for uh, for the school, and um, you will be able to sign up for classes probably in the next week or two. I'm not in charge of that, but uh, yeah, Caleb, is there a, what you can do. I, I'm totally ignorant on this. Mike would be the one, maybe. To, to, is there a specific place people who are just learning this for the first time, they could sign in and then just, they would just get emails from Tor Resource Institute. Like, like, yes. Yeah, so if you go to Tor they would just stay in touch. Yep. Go to torresource.com and you can, um, you can sign up, I believe on that page on the homepage for emails, uh, sign up there and you'll start getting emails on when classes start. You can Google it. And yes. then, there, there it is. I was looking for it. And then also on, on torresource.com, there is something that says Institute. If you want in- information about the school and how you can take classes, uh, click on that thing that just says Institute. All the information and links are there. And uh, it is also in our chat right now. Thank you, Mike. Um, and we will, oh, summer classes. There is a summer class. Yeah, I don't know. You know, maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't know if we should call that a class or not. It's, it's two lectures that we're going to be putting up in August. I've had I've had more calls than I would have ever expected on this. But uh, uh, if you want a lecture from Rob and a lecture from my father, Tim Hegg, uh, you can sign up to receive them or to be able to access them, I should say, on August 1st. And they will be released then. And there will be a chat on that. There, you can comment on that page uh, that you have to sign up to get access to. And once you do that, 
um, then you will be able to comment and watch those videos. So do that today. And that uh, link is in the um, in the chat. Okay, also, if you have not already, please, please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. We just hit 7,900 subscribers. That's quite a milestone. Yeah. We only need a 100 more and we'll hit... Now, okay, here's the thing. Now, I know that we're supposed to be talking about theology by this point in the show, but I think that this will be fun for, for our audience. I watch some famous YouTubers from time to time, and every time they hit a milestone, they do something spectacular. You know, like they jump in a bucket of jello or something, you know, something <laughs> like, I don't know. Now, when we hit 10,000 subscribers, what, maybe we should do something fun. We, we will take, we'll take suggestions on what we should do when we hit 10,000 subscribers. And, uh, and send, send in your, your wants. And oh, um, no. maybe, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll oblige when we'll, we'll announce the winner of, or what we're going to do in the next couple of shows. So stay tuned. Okay. Let's jump in. <laughs> oh no. What have, we, what have you done? <laughs> It'll be fun. Okay. Oh wait, you didn't make any promises though. I made no promises yet, but, <laughs> but you never can tell. Okay. Um, let me see here. So let's refresh people's memories. For those who have not been here in three weeks, all of us, uh, three weeks ago, we talked about church membership. And this actually got a lot of, of comments. There were people on both sides. Some people said, hey, man, totally agree with you guys. You know, we need church membership. And then we had other people who said, no, it's not biblical. Uh, this is, and we, we don't need this. So we're going to read the two, two main comments from people who kind of, I don't know, pushed back. Actually, there's three comments on this. Okay, so you'll get a, a wide swath of the uh, of the ideas on this topic. LJ wrote in, in just a very one-line, quick comment, says, what if there is an abuse of spiritual authority? We see this often now in our modern time, don't we? Um, this oh, happens boy, a lot, yeah. I think, because people are, uh, you know, we've talked a lot I've talked a lot on this show about the idea that America has made a, a new God. People think that it's a Christian nation. It's not. It's a self nation. People are worshiping self. It's all about comfort and me and how I feel and, uh, you know, my feelings and all this kind of stuff. And um, I think that there is a, a group of people that have realized that they could make money peddling the gospel hmm. and uh because or, or of that, a a uh a twisted version of it we should exactly. say right? exactly so actually i saw a meme on uh on facebook the other day it said uh the, the pros what the prosperity gospel is preaching is everything that satan tempted jesus with i yeah. thought that was real I thought that was really interesting. Anyway, uh, the point yeah. being is that there's certainly spiritual abuses in the church. You know, this, is, I mean, not to call out any one particular group, but the Southern Baptist Convention is now uh, is now dealing with, uh, you know, sexual immorality among their leaders and how that is needs to be dealt with. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that does need to be dealt with. Um so all of that to say, what do we do with spiritual abuses or physical abuses or whatever it may be in the church? Mm. I fully believe, I'll go first and then you can step in. I fully believe that uh, the, the word of God is supreme, right? Sola Scriptura. And so we know that uh, elders can and will fall from time to time. And that uh, this is one of the reasons... This is one of the reasons I would not ever go to a church that has a singer, a single elder because elders need to be held accountable as well. They need to answer to someone. They need to answer to an elder board. They need to answer to their congregation. And if they're not held accountable, then humans will be humans, right? We are sinful. And unfortunately, uh, that is one of the reasons that, that I think that the scriptures continually talk about elders in a community instead of elder. I, 
I actually have a problem. Most churches use uh, language like senior pastor or head pastor or something like that. I personally, now this wouldn't, I wouldn't disqualify a church if they use that kind of language. But um, I personally don't like that kind of language because I believe that we have one head pastor, one shepherd, one lead pastor, and that is Yeshua, Jesus, right? Um, and so, but nonetheless, this is this is the reason that I think that uh, elders have to be held accountable. Fathers have to protect their fa- families and their their uh, their wives, their children, right? And uh, then people in authority who abuse that authority must be held accountable. Rob, yeah, the uh, well, the word for pastor is is uh, shepherd. It's the same word, and you know, I, I recently had a phone call with a someone who's a messianic rabbi or they have uh received some sort of messianic rabbinic ordination so somebody had a printer and printed something (laughs) out (laughs) well the idea is they i i basically you know uh, protested that they were going to host shapira and um you know, I did my best to try to, to point out, I'm like, if, if you're a shepherd and this is independent of whether you've got elders or not, your focus, if you're a genuine shepherd, your concern is for the health of the flock and the safety of the flock that, and, and there's two aspects to that. There's the, there's the feeding of the flock, right? And making sure that they're getting fresh water and good nutritious food and not poison, right? That they're not eating stuff that's bad for them. But also you're protecting them against what? Predators. Isn't that the main function? Isn't that the the main function of the elder? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so the the bigger as as the as the uh, a local group that is the flock local uh, version instance of, of Yeshua's flock. Cause of course there's one flock, but in, in uh, a local in, uh, instance, if it gets bigger and bigger, it obviously the, the, the leadership and pr- that protective and teaching structure needs to grow to, to do the task at hand. The task at hand is feed the flock, protect the flock because you're accountable to Yeshua, right? Okay, so that means in the both aspects, there's, there's the caring for the flock in terms of nourishment and, and health. And then there's the, so that's an active form that's oriented towards the flock and providing for the flock. The other is, is the flock is more passive because the, the shepherding team are, are fighting off they have to take a stand against predators. Right. They have to take a stand for something. Right. There's got to be a place where you stand and put they put themselves on the line for the defense of the flock. So it's a different role or it's a different part of the job than the feeding. So it's just so as important. But here's a question, Caleb. The shepherd that is worried that puts the flock first versus the, sh- the quote shepherd that just thinks about their own themselves. The shepherd that is concerned about the flock is going to behave a certain way. Right. The shepherd that's concerned just about themselves is going to behave a different way. Right. And the, the, Ooh, boy. You know, we, we've, we've taken, we've heard from people in the past that we were, we were mean. <laughs> we call out people by name like Shapira or uh, who are some others? Uh, Staley. Um, I don't remember some of the, you know, just any of the, any of the people, you know, we taught, there was a, there was a quote rabbi uh, Richardson or something like that, that we, that had written that stuff about the apostolic writings being originally in Hebrew. So I mean, we we're like, no, you know, and that's, it's wrong. That's wrong. And we've called it out because these are in each of these situations, these people had published 
they'd put material out. And then we, we get a Heiser's another one that, that are very well known. They've distributed their material publicly for years and we get calls about them. We get emails about them. And so we take a stand. Right. And we're accountable like to that. Yeshua, you know, and, and we can do this even, even if, if the people listening here might not be under our local, you know, in, in our, the local flock, I consider it still our, we're, we're still accountable to Yeshua for the words we're speaking, how we're representing the word of God, what we're saying the word of God means. Hey, but I mean, what's interesting about that is, you know, we have a, a YouTube show, right? It's on YouTube. We have almost 8,000 subscribers, which is mind boggling to me. But at the same time, every show that we do, I expect that people are going to say, you guys are nuts. Yeah. This is wrong. And this is why I'm going to show you why it's wrong. But, and I don't see people being like, oh, no, you didn't go to them first. You didn't go, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the thing is, is that like, it's when, when we put something out, when we publish something publicly, I don't expect that no one can sp- speak against it. That's the whole point of, yeah, let them. <laughs> it's sharpening. Let them, let them, let them try to dissect it all they want. And, so anyway, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, but back to the original question. Okay. Let's circle back here and then we'll move on. What do you think about, I mean, how do you look at the leader who ha, who spiritually abuses? I mean, we see minor offenses of this all the way up to sexual offenses in, in mm-hmm. places like the Southern Baptist, Baptist Convention. convention blah, blah. And then we also see it go way beyond that into cult-like behavior, right? People manipulate. Yeah, what happens and- when when you have a... Now, I'm not up on the Southern Baptist Convention details as you are, but what happens when you've had the offices in place? In other words, you've had an, uh, a vetted eldership and, and, and this stuff still happens and there's still covers up. We're, we're still... Oh yeah, it, it, the institution does not solve the problem of sin. Yeshua right. solved the problem of sin. Right, and um, we, as far as I know, I mean, we're, we're we're just needing to be in a position of crying out to the Lord. You know, I mean, that's okay. You know, so we, I, we need I, His I, wisdom. I, we need His guidance, and we're in a place of discipline. I mean, in a way, I think the word of God is rare right now in the earth. Sure. I think it's, it's rare. Well, let's look, let's, let's expand this conversation. Cause we had multiple comments on that, um, on, on this video that we put out. So let's expand the, uh, the, the conversation, Joshua, who I believe, maybe I'm wrong. I thought he was in the chat room. Maybe he's not. Uh, Joshua Roden, he says, I'm not sure I entirely agree with your, with your take solely because someone can and will leave or simply not submit to the authority set within the church member or not. I personally don't like the whole membership idea and, the, and think that like in the book of Acts, the Lord will, will add as he sees fit to the congregation. If you don't want to submit yourself to the authority, then simply leave, or the person should be asked to leave. Okay, so I, I see where you're coming from, and I agree. I think that uh, one of the problems that we have in modern in our modern time is that look, it, let, let's go back first century. Okay, if you were in Ephesus, m- maybe you had two groups, two two maybe on each side of the city there was a congregation quote unquote, a house congregation of believers. If you were in one of them and they said, you've sinned, get out. Guess what? Not only did the people in Ephesus on the other side of the city hear about it, but the people in Rome heard about it. The people in Jerusalem heard about it, right? You would not be accepted into any congregation. That's how it was. So church discipline in the first century, I think, you know, when in Rome or uh, in Acts, when, when Paul gets to Rome in 28, they say, we have received no letter about you. We've heard no word about you. In other words, like from Jerusalem. 
So in other words, like we haven't heard that you're under any church discipline or anything like that. And this, this is perhaps unbelieving Jews at the time. But the point is, is that word spread. Now, in our modern time, um, I think you have the same thing kind of going on. If somebody were to start coming to a church, when I was pastoring, if somebody came into the church, I would want to know where they came, what church they came from, or what congregation they came from. And then I would actively call the leadership of the previous congregation to see why they, why they were no longer there. And I would expect that of, of other congregations. If congregations aren't doing that, it's probably not a place that that person is going to be fed much anyway. In other words, church discipline still works. The reason that you have membership, in my opinion, and the re- is so that you say, I will submit to the authority here. If you get kicked out, the chances that you just move on to another great church that's amazing and they don't find out that you're under church discipline and say something, I mean, maybe I have rose, you know, rose-colored glasses on. I don't know, but I know that there are churches in I know the churches, the great churches in our in our city. Uh, and there are a couple of them. They talk. People know each other. If somebody gets kicked out for, you know, not submitting to authority for cheating on their wife or something, everyone knows. Now that might not be the the case across the board, but you know, we're on the, yeah, anyway. Well, the, Rob, like if you look in the, in it, where I live and you look at the different messianic quote, messianic communities, it's been through a blender over the last 10, 15, 20 years, like a, uh, like a blender of false teachers. Uh, it, you know, people who <laughs> kind of created their own authority, um, and, you know, and have since like totally flipped. Um, and you've got, oh, okay, hang on just you've a got, you've got people after people, after people who have been damaged and it's just a mess. Right. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like a, hur- you know, a couple of hurricanes came through and just tore everything up and people are just like looking around and they're all this damage and, and they, it's still, it's, it's really sad. You know, it's, it's sad. So, so I, I completely agree with you, but here's the thing in, in my city, I'm thinking of a couple of churches. If a person goes to one of the churches that isn't going to care where they came from, Oh, you're, you know, Oh, you cheated on your wife. Come on in open. All are welcome. Oh, you're, you know, you're a homosexual. Come on in. All are welcome. Those kind of churches, if a person who's under church discipline goes to those churches, it's their loss anyway. They're not going to be fed the way that they need to be fed. That's it. People might say, oh, they're still going to a church. You're not being fed from the word, not the way that you should be. You're still, the Lord is still disciplining you. It's the churches that actually practice church discipline. Those are the ones that, that believers need to be in. And if you get kicked out of one of those churches, the next church that practices church discipline is not welcoming you, you with open arms, at least not until they find, not once they find out that you've been under church discipline for something. That's the point. That's my point. Now, once again, it might not always work that way in our modern time, but I think that the whole point, I think that's one of the reasons that church di- uh, membership is actually important. Exactly what is what is being said here. the The conversation goes on. By the way, the Crisco kid says, "Glad you addressed this. Got a good video, but here's a question: How does a lone wolf take away anything from church discipline?" And this is on the heels of what we just talked about. If this one needs discipline and won't submit and decides to leave, it's the same result as the one in Matthew 18. They're out of the congregation and treated as a sinner. Done deal. The man in 1 Corinthians 5 might not have ever been heard from if the church at Corinth had dealt with him. Uh, Okay, he, I don't know if I agree with that. He either would have submitted or left and the sin would have been purged. They did not, so uh, they did nothing, so Paul had to get involved. I'm sure you didn't mean it this way, but your statement comes across to me as almost vindictive. We, quote, we, like, I think he's like, yeah, anyway, we can't have people just leaving before we have a chance to shame them and call them out. Not only that, but an official church membership 
doesn't chain them to the church building. They can still leave at any time. I seem to be missing your point. Yeah, okay, so I think this is a good point. Those who are lone wolves, and I'm not saying that everybody has to sign a piece of paper on the dotted line, I'm a member of this church. What I, what I see church membership is, as is an agreement that I will submit to the authority of the eldership in this church. If church discipline comes down or you decide to leave, that's on you. You might not, I mean, once again, I think that uh, the break from good community is going to affect you if you leave. If you're just bouncing from church to church, from congregation to congregation, you're not under any authority and you're not willing to submit to authority, then you're not willing to submit to the discipline of the Lord. Well, yeah, and that's a dangerous, that's an unstable person. I mean, even to try, if you were just to even be a friend with that person, you couldn't really have any substantive or deep friendship with such a person because they, they're they not attached to anything, right? I mean, they're, they're, that means they probably treat all their relationships the same way. Um, so like how, in other words, what our character as new creations in Christ means we learn, we learn what it means to love and we learn what it means to what faithfulness means, even in the, you know, doing the hard thing, um, which is, you know, when there is discipline is to, to say, look, there's a path, the path forward here is a path where we, we stay connected, but truth needs to be front and center on the table in front of us. Um, otherwise we're, we're compromising what biblical love is. And then we're going to shift into just kind of this smiley face, social pat each other on the back thing. Aren't we glad we have some place to go and feel like we're not alone. And I've seen that a lot in the messianic world where truth is brushed aside and they just, it's just tickling ears. You know, a bunch of people who like to get together. Everybody has their own pet doctrines and they just, you know, kind of hang out and there is no, there is no clarity on what the word of God is saying. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's just so much, uh, going on in the chat room here. I'm, I don't know if I should address any of it or not. Uh, really good comments though. Uh, there, there's some really good comments here. Um, I'll read one or two of them. It makes me think of chi- a child that receives no consequences from the parents for uh, wrongs done. The word says these parents hate the child. The child loses. And that's exact. So this is a great point. If you're in a, ch- somebody asked me, I think I've shared this multiple times on, on this program. So I'll share it again. <laughs> Cause why not? Uh, somebody asked me, if you were looking for a church, what's the first thing you'd look for? And my response was the number one thing I'd look for is church discipline. A church that does not discipline their members for sins, for continued sin, is a church that is not following the word. They don't care about the word of God. And that's not that's not a place where the Holy Spirit is going to refine at all. Well, we should clarify that this presumes that they're, right, 66 books, right? Because, I mean, you could find... The Mormons are really good at discipline, um, for example. Sure. Uh, so, so obviously, you know, sola scriptura. You, well, you you have to have yeah, sola yeah. scriptura first and foremost to, to even be able to properly church discipline. Right. But right. I, I guess the point is, is that if you if you're going to a church and there's no church discipline, this is how you get into, uh, you know, churches accepting homosexuality, churches accepting, well, you know female pastors. This is how you get into, I mean, all a slew of, of doctrines that should not be accepted by the church. And, and you know what, but as new creations in Messiah, we love the truth. Even, even if, even if it hurts that something, someone, a brother needs to tell me something that, oh man, right. That's, that confronts me with something ugly about myself or something that's difficult to hear. But, but if I value truth, if I love Yeshua, then I'm actually going to receive that and, and, and be humbled maybe for the short run, but I'm going to be edified for the long run. The person who, who just says, no, nope, sorry, you don't have anything to speak into my life, uh, you know, and I'm out of here. That person, it, 
really doesn't even know what it means to be a new creation in Messiah. So uh, Brandon asks a great question. He says, what about the church that kicks out people who believe God's law still applies? There are two, there are two kinds of churches who... I well, haven't seen, I, I, I don't have that in my own direct experience. That's, so I, I personally... Neither, neither do I personally, but at the same time, uh, I think that there are two, usually two situations that uh, would do this. Uh, that, that Number one is when a person who believes that the law still applies is belligerent about their belief. And it's like the cage stage, right? They're a Torah terrorist. So they go into the, the congregation and they continue to disrupt or try to beat people over the head with their, with their Bible. They're a divisive. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. If you're divisive and you're not coming with the spirit of the Lord, um, then the church, whether they're right or wrong on the issue, is going to kick you out. And ultimately, I think that that is, a, that is just as much a problem for the church that kick, kicks out the, per, the person as it is for the person that gets kicked out. In other words, there is a correction that needs to happen in you. That's number one. Number two <clears throat> is the church that... <clears throat> Excuse me. The church that is uh, boldly saying that the law of God, uh, and once again, I've never experienced this myself. Um, they uh, they kick people out for. I think that there, one of two things is happening: either there is a misunderstanding there, or if the church is really just rejecting the law of God, then the Lord is telling you to leave that church. The Lord is moving you on. Uh, Brandon says, my church has done that to so-called Hebrew roots people. I'm not sure of all the details of how it went down. I, you know, once again, uh, I think that we, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that has happened to good Bible believing people. Um, and I think when that does happen, I, I think that that is sad. However, I think that in a lot of the cases where I've talked to people who've said, my church kicked me out because I believe in the law there is a lot more going on there. Usually the person who says that is very difficult to get along with, even when they're in a congregation that believes that the law still applies. In other words, there is a issue of how they are dealing with people. Um, however, however, uh, I think that there are good Bible believing people who have been kicked out of communities for believing the law. And uh, in that case, I think personally, that the Lord is telling you it is time to find a different congregation. It's time to move on. And if that's the case, great. Go where the Lord leads. Um, <clears throat> what is the will of Jesus? That is the only law that matters. You can't answer my question. The will of Jesus is to follow his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. First John, he will write the Torah on your heart. Jeremiah 31. Um, uh, oh, I have one. If, if, if you love that. me, keep and my commandments. And, yeah, in John 7, he says, my teaching is not my own, but my father who sent me. Right. So his will but is what's, that we keep what's his the commandments, context? which is the Torah. What are we, the will of Jesus? Yeah, uh, we, got a, we got a loose cannon in the chat room. Uh, Morningstar is, is pretty sure that we shouldn't be keeping the Sabbath anymore because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, we'll just let the chat room take care of the rest of that. Oh, okay. okay. Um, oh, so on. the idea is that there's a that Jesus is different than the Father. Jesus' teachings different than the Torah. Right. That is an anti. That's a uh, that's oh. an anti-trinitarian view. I think. So that would not be a, a pronomian. No. Anti. Yeah. Anti-pronomian. Antinomian. Anti. There we go. Antinomian. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on. Brandon writes in, this is, I think, probably going to be the most fun. What is your definition of the law of Christ found in Galatians and the law of liberty and the royal law as re read about in James? I'm going to let Rob take this one since he has done so much work in Galatians and has taught through Galatians. Uh, do, you, do you need the references? No, no, that, it's a great question. Who who asked this one? Brandon, he's in the chat room. Oh, cool. Hi, Brandon. Yeah, good. I, I love, I mean, it's a great topic. Um, th there's actually a connection between uh, the Galatians, um, which uh, the beginning of chapter five anyway, 
and into chapter six, he talks about freedom. And then it's the same word that James uses. Eleutheria is the word in, in Greek, um, the law of freedom. So the law of freedom is the law of Christ. It's, uh, there's different words. It's also called the whole law um, elsewhere. And it, it, the core, it, it, these are shorthand ways of describing Yeshua's clear instruction about understanding and how, how to read the scriptures. And it's differentiated from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes, you know, et cetera, from his time. Yeshua makes it very clear that the greatest commandment in the Torah is uh, given in Deuteronomy. It's, it's Moses iterates it at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. And it's from Deuteronomy chapter six, right? Shema Yisrael, right? Hear, O Israel, Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and your strength, etc. cetera. Um, that that is, that is the core. Uh, and without this foundation, it's like building a house on sand. You're not building on rock. And there's a second commandment that is in absolute coherence with the first commandment and that they, they, they come together because we're human made in God's image among other humans that are made in God's image that the second commandment is, uh, is to be understood and is inseparable from the greatest commandment. They come, they come together, they come attached. And that is love your neighbor as yourself, which is given in Leviticus 19. And Every, every other commandment is contingent for it to have any meaning before to God at all is to be, is contingent on that fact. Um, and so, I mean, if you look at Cain and Abel, it says God looked to Abel and to his mincha and to his offering favorably. But God did not look favorably to Cain and to his mincha. So God looks to the person first and then looks to the deed. And we learn in, in Hebrews, it says that Abel had faith. By faith, Abel offered a, an acceptable sacrifice. That, that the idea of God demanding all our heart, love of him fully, is not a new idea that emerges with Jesus, with the incarnation, with Jesus preaching in Galilee. Yeshua comes to teach the heart of the Torah that has always been the Torah. In other words, if we were to imagine a situation, well, we know, <laughs> we know that there actually was a time at the transfiguration where uh, Moses and Elijah appeared with Yeshua. But if we set that aside and just imagine Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David, you know, and Elijah, all coming and sitting at Yeshua's feet at the Sermon on the Mount, for example, they would just be, preach it, <laughs> preach it, right? They, they would absolutely be the background chorus to Yeshua's preaching. There would be no incoherence between any of those, what we call Old Testament saints, and what Yeshua is teaching, they would be like this beautiful, it would be like the woodwinds and the strings like Caleb was talking about earlier, right? And it would be, you know, in, in uh, wonderful uh, harmony and unity. It's a, it's a unified message, a unified voice. And this is the law of freedom. Why? Because it's, it is um, the, the story of our redemption is built into the Torah because the story of the fall and the story of sin is, is in the Torah. And why this gets back to what we we're talking about community, because by God's wisdom, by his character, love is inseparable from truth. Right. And, yes. and so when God breaks into history and reveals himself, he cannot lie about himself. God right. doesn't pretend to be something he's not. Humans have a big problem of pretending to be things they're not. Many of us, we've 
probably all had relationships where we think somebody is something. And then later we find out they were something else. God's not that way. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when he reveals himself to we fallible, finite, you know, sinful creatures, the truth, he, he cannot reveal his love to us without also confronting us with the, with the expression of, of the truth. And that means sin has to be called out for what it is. Because why? Because he is holy. Back to church discipline. Yeah. And, and so all these things are tied together. The freedom is freedom. It, it, to, to worship the living God is true freedom. Right. To worship God, to like the first of the Westminster uh, <laughs> in the catechism, right? To glorify God, to enjoy him forever. That is freedom. That is no the, the most mighty Pharaoh, the, mo, the worst uh, dictator, communist dictator, has not, they have no grip on you. Why? Because you don't fear them. Because you have, you have true wisdom, true knowledge, which comes out of fear of the living God. And, 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 and he has your soul in his hands. And, and it does, they, can, they can harm the body, but they can't hurt your soul. That's freedom. The people who are worried about what other people think, the people that are into this social, I'm just going to smile and wave and, and uh, you know, I'm just, you do your, you do you, I'll do me. And we'll just agree to disagree. Live your best life Those now, people Rob. have no root in themselves. Right. They're not taking a stand for anything because there is no discipline. They don't have any discipline in their life. There's no spiritual discipline in their life that matches with any spiritual discipline in a, in a larger body. So uh, I think it's interesting because you bring up uh, the same, things that uh that many christian commentators have which is so if you look on like uh, got questions which is a, a christian uh site or if you look at uh, even john piper they'll say that the law of christ is these two commandments love your neighbor as yourself and love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength and um so when i think of that you know on these two commands the whole of torah the whole hot, of torah right? exactly yeah. And so, so I think of exactly. that as, you know, it's interesting because I'll go on sites, you go on website, right? And in their menu, they'll have a drop down. And so you drop down and there will be different, you know, this is on Torah resource too. You'll, you'll see like, uh, you'll see things and there's a little carrot next to it and you hover over that carrot and all of a sudden something pops out and a huge long list of other things that you can click on pops out. And essentially I think of this at like, like these two commands, you have love the Lord, your God, you hover over that. And guess what? All of the commands that have to do with how you serve God. pop. I out. love it. That's awesome. And then you hover <laughs> over, love your neighbor as yourself. And all of those commands that have to do with, with other people and loving other people pop out. And what, what happens if you put all of those commands together? You have the Torah, you have, you have the law of God, you know? And, and so these are the two greatest commandments, but it's the nice thing about this is that this isn't a, <laughs> off the wall, you know, what Rob is saying no. is not an off we can't the wall walk messianic in faith. You cannot teaching. walk with the Lord right. and disregard his word. I, like, you know what I mean? It, you can't, you can't walk with the Lord and disregard his word at the same time that what you see over and over again throughout the Bible is the, is when you had people that, you know, did what happened It never goes well. So I, hang on, I got to expand. My my mind's going okay. on this website idea now. Okay. <laughs> you got to build it. it. it, it uh, yeah. And so so here it is. You got, so, you know, <laughs> people have broken the Ten Commandments into, into two different categories. The first have to do with loving God. And then the last half of it has to do with loving persons. So if you were to uh, hover over love God, maybe you have these these commands that pop out that are the first of the Ten Commandments. And then if you hover over those, all that pop out, you know, is that because those are uh, those are the the headers in Deuteronomy. Each one of the Ten Commandments is like the chapter heading for different sections of Deuteronomy. Anyway, you can tell I've been working in websites recently. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So fulfill, what does Paul mean back to when he says fulfill the law of Christ? If you go to, this is Galatians 6, the context is, a brother who 
has an obligation to do something difficult. And what that is, is to go to another brother. I'm just using brother right now, but it's, the sisters are involved, obviously. And to confront another believer about sin. That's Galatians 6 verses 1 through 3 or 4. That's, that is it. And, and that's shaped as bearing one another's burdens. That means you, you don't lead with cutting a person off. You lead with a desire to say, hey, I, you know, with the assumption that they don't see it. And it says, you, you know, you who are spiritually minded, you know, be careful lest you also uh, be tempted. Like the idea is, and, and all he's doing, he's just putting Yeshua's teaching of the, you know, get the log out of your own eye, and then you can help another person who just has a speck. Um, Paul's just giving that same teaching. He's just, he's just unpacking it. He's just explaining. He's like, look, what it means is, is when you go to, to address the issue of sin, that means you're bringing the truth of God's word, which is light into a relationship, into a person's life. And it takes courage and risk because they might, they might turn around and they might be like the, the pig, right? Yeshua says, you know, what happens when you give your pearls to swine, you know? So you, you, it's not easy, you know, to, to walk that path. It's, but it's necessary. And in so doing, it, it shapes your own character because you're before the Lord in prayer and, and humbly seeking him and, and waiting on the Lord to, to guide you in this process. And that is a, dis, a process of discipline. But the idea is that the brother, you're going to, this is what they call win your brother. You've won your brother. Why does Paul use win? It, it's, it's a curious thing. He uses it also. It's like, well, to, to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews, right? To those who are under law, I became as those under law in order to win those under the law, right? Why does he use this win over and over again? The idea is each of those is lacking the light of the truth of, of Yeshua's law. And in each of these situations, he's going to try to connect with them by build relational capital. So he knows that, that, that any of those people that whether, you now Paul was already a Jew, but what does he mean? He becomes like a Jew. It doesn't mean he pretends to be something he's not. It means what he does. He, he establishes genuine relationship. He is that he does what he does. Uh, uh, advance work, so to speak, to build a legitimate relationship. So people know that he's legit. He's not just, I'm not just coming through town, preaching a message, want to, you know, hand out the collection plate. And then I'm out of here. He's like legit to, to different types of people. And then, but he's never without the law of Messiah. He always has something to bring in each of those places. And in each of those places, he's trying to win somebody what does he mean to win? It means I'm going to bring them the Torah of the Messiah and I'm going to address the, their lack and their need for what I have to give. And if, if they, by the power of the spirit, regenerating their heart, come to faith, he says, that's a win. It doesn't mean he's winning an argument. It doesn't mean he's beating them over the head with scriptures. It means that he's building, he's seeking in connective relationship to bring the truth of the word of God as a, as a searchlight into that situation where it's needed. And, uh, and so that's, that's bearing burden. That is, you, you can't build relationship with somebody and not share some of the burden of their life. Now that doesn't mean you innate become an enabler and just, do something for somebody, you know, because he says at the end, he says, each shall bear their own load. But if these are temporary time, temporary things where we bear with somebody with the goal of them being able to stand on their own two feet again, spiritually, right? And even materially. Okay, I'm, I'm going long winded here, Caleb. Take it. All right. Uh, you're good. Um, I'm going to put Morning Stern timeout a second time. Um, okay. So, 
John, what's Lawson, going on? What someone oh, got nothing, in time don't, out? Don't don't even worry about it. Uh, oh, cool. John writes this. <laughs> he says, uh, "Please share how the ceremonial laws are also the law of Christ." Okay, I can do this. Let's first we will address the idea that there are such thing as ceremonial laws. The Torah never gives any categories of ceremonial, moral, or civil laws. That is man-made. And the idea that the Torah can be broken up into that uh, is simply not correct. And I have linked a video that I just released on the, that exact topic. Can the Torah be broken up into civil, ceremonial, and moral? And the answer is absolutely not. So for instance, um, I, and I'll, we'll use a ceremonial law here. Um, certainly it would be immoral Okay, to uh, to uh, to offer sacrifices to a false god is that correct? I think everybody would say, yeah, that's immoral. However, people say that we're not supposed to sacrifice anymore because it's a civil law. So, which one is it? Is sacrifice a civil law or is it a moral law? And the answer is yes. There's no such thing as ceremonial law. There is law. There is, and the laws that people want to classify as ceremonial are laws that uh, uh, that are laws that have to do with the temple in many cases, not all the time, but in many cases. And what was the temple? The temple was to uh, show us the work that the Messiah would do and did do. We see that the apostles still sacrifice after Christ resurrects. And so ultimately, um, these are laws that have to do with uh, God for our own, so once again, moral laws, they're moral laws, we, but they connect us to God. So if we think of that, if we think of that uh, category of love the Lord your God with all your heart, the ceremonial laws, quote unquote, even though I reject the idea that there are ceremonial laws, would be underneath the God tab, right? So those still apply if we are loving God with all our heart then the quote unquote ceremonial laws, which once again, I reject the, the category, but if we're going to say that there are ceremonial laws, those laws would be under the category of love the Lord your God with all your heart. So that's still the law. Once again, I think that all of the laws of, of, of God found within the law of Moses, which is, we'll just refer to it as the Torah, all of the laws within Torah fall under one of those two categories, which are either love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or under the category of love your neighbor as yourself. So the, the, the law of Christ, so let me, here's the thing is, is Rob has done an excellent job, much better than I could ever do in terms of what is the law of Christ. However, I would say that the, if we put this up against the term old law, which is only used one time in all of scripture, right? And how does Paul use that term? It's in second Corinthians. I think he uses it. My father's made this argument in a well-written paper. Um, and I, and I, so I can, all I can do is, is, uh, build off of his scholarship, but he has argued that, uh, Paul uses this term old in various different ways throughout his letters. Uh, for instance, old man would be the man who was before he came to Christ. Um, and, uh, there's other examples in his paper. So the idea of old is oftentimes used by Paul as, uh, seeing things, uh, before a person comes to Christ and the term old law or old covenant, I think it's old covenant is the term we're actually looking for here, is actually used in that way too, right? So if we look at the old covenant as opposed to the law of Christ, I would argue the old covenant is the is trying to keep the commands of God without a faith in the Messiah, without Christ. That would be the old law and that is condemning. You will you are under the wrath of God because you are not in Christ. That's the old law the old covenant. The law of Christ is coming to the, the covenants of God through Christ. We are then free to keep the commandments without fear of retribution because we are able to keep them through Christ. That's how I see all of a sudden. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not freedom. So freedom from, I guess we didn't, I didn't mention that you're not, it's not that you're free from any obligation to God. You're free from sin. You're you're free from being in darkness and death and bound to uh, impurity and uncleanness and all the lists of things that are an abomination to the Lord. You're free from those things. Yeah. 
We're not under the condemnation of the law because we've come through Christ. Which means you have access, like it says in Romans 5, 1, access to this grace in which you stand by Yeshua's shed blood, right? You have shalom with sure. God. That's not to be taken lightly. If you're justified by Messiah in faith, you have shalom with God. That means you're not under the ledger of condemnation. But that means God's law still stands. If there's a ledger of, if, if, if there's danger, right? If, if there's danger for those outside of Messiah, what is the strength of that danger? The enduring fact of the reality of God's holiness and his revealed law, and that, that sin is a transgression against his holiness, and the, there's wrath that follows that. Okay, hang on just a sec. The, uh, so a couple things in the chat room. Uh, the beginning of wisdom, which is Andrew uh, Schumacher, he says, uh, with respect, I did watch that video. He's talking about the video I did on separation of ceremonial, civil, and moral laws. Uh, I did watch that video, and it seems to be arguing against a straw man position of, on the categories of law. Okay, you can think that. However, that's not an argument. You can't just say it's a straw man argument. You'd have to actually show that it's a straw man argument. It's not a straw man argument if you look at something like the Sabbath. The Sabbath is uh, broken up into, you can put the Sabbath in all three of the categories, that peop, that the man-made categories, which are civil, ceremonial, moral. All, the Sabbath is all of those things. So if you're going to say that the moral law still applies today, then certainly the Sabbath still applies um, because the Sabbath is clearly a moral law. A uh, man gets stoned for, for breaking it. Uh, so it's clearly a moral law. Um, anyway, uh, John says Moses was, quote, in Christ, correct? Yes, Moses, I would say it was in Christ. He kept, kept Torah in Christ. That is correct. And this is an interesting comment because actually... Then the question becomes, did Israel keep the, the, keep the commands in Christ? And I would argue that those who reject the land-grant treaty, I, I, maybe we can't make, broad, uh, make such broad statements as, you know, everyone in that generation uh, was not saved or something to that effect. But clearly they were not, uh, they were not, um, they, they were not in covenant, at least in the land-grant treaty part of it. Now the question would be, could they be in the new covenant if they were not in the, uh, if they were not in the land grant treaty covenant? That's a good question. Um, anyway. Um, okay. And do we have anything, uh, that's right. I think people say you're observing the tour. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sean Fisher, uh, Sean in the chat room says the straw man, I think is when people say you're observing the Torah. Did you read Galatians? Because Galatians is about people trying to gain salvation by observing the, the law. Exactly. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's some good, um, there's some good, uh, comments going on here. I, I'll read Andrew's second comment. Um, the categories are not necessarily distinct buckets. People who have studied them and still believe in the categories hold that a law may fit into more than one. Yes, so I absolutely agree with you. And is it helpful? Be- so the point is, how? What are they serving to describe then? If if they're if they're not categories, how how are the categories helpful? What are they helping us accomplish? Well, so what are- he 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 makes one more. Uh, he makes actually he just made another comment, but he makes another comment. He says examples that fit more than one place, only refute a very shallow, rigid understanding of the categories. Okay, so hang on just a sec. Let's, let's, I I appreciate Andrew's uh, taking a stand for what he believes here. However, let's take this to the logical conclusion. What is the point of making these categories if the Bible does not make them? And my argument to that would be, or my suggestion to that would be, is that people who hold to these categories want to say these laws have been done away with, these laws have not. It's a way to say that these laws don't apply anymore. So when someone like Walter Kaiser, who believes that the Torah is, that was a question that I asked Kaiser when I interviewed him. I asked him, do you believe that the Torah can be broken up into civil, ceremonial, and moral? And he said, yes, I do. Now, when Walter Kaiser is pushed hard on things like the Sabbath, uh, the conversation becomes very interesting because since he believes in built-in obsolescence, if you push him on whether or not the Sabbath is a moral law, he has to admit that it is. And so now all of a sudden those categories are no longer helpful for the people who are trying to argue that the ceremonial laws are done away with because all of a sudden the Sabbath law is what? It's moral. It's moral and it's ceremonial and it's civil, right? 
the the man got put to death for it, so it's clearly a civil a civil infraction. So so that's a really good really good point. And so what what it makes me ask is this, Caleb. Maybe you can help me. Are there instances, and maybe the brother who's posting the comment that you're interacting might be able to answer this. What's the gain if if the people who are advancing the use of these categories, like promoting the use of these these categories, if if their aim is not to say, or if 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 these categories don't describe something like the Sabbath, what is their motivation? Like, is there an alternative explanation of uh, other than what you're suggesting? I, it seems to me like the now it has never been a main issue for me because I've always just said, well, that's not in the Bible. But every time I've heard in my personal experience, when I've talked with somebody about this division, it's exact the it's exactly tied to what you're saying. It's always tied to an agenda that wants to say, I don't have to do those. But these, the I'm only obligated for these. I don't have to do any of those things. Whew. That's why. And then it's like I don't need to keep the Sabbath. You know, the food laws don't apply to me, et cetera, et cetera. I've never heard that those separate from each other. So I'm just asking: Are there other people who use that categorization for some other theological purpose? Talking about God's character, for example. Right. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm asking. But in my experience, it fits exactly with what you're saying. And my, you know, it's always been tied to a main thrust is what, what do I got to do? And what doesn't have anything to do with me? Yeah, so, so, and, so, and not just me personally and Christians. So, so I, I agree with you. I, I've never, I have personally, and you know, uh, perhaps our brother Andrew and because Andrew, I believe is, is, uh, since he's taking this position publicly, I, I think in not just on our, I mean, uh, for those who don't know Andrew, Andrew has taken this, uh, has taken this position very publicly on, um, uh, what was the, uh, cultish I think is where, uh, Andrew has, has put his, his views forward on this. Um, and honestly, I, I, I appreciate Andrew <clears throat> because he's, he's coming from a reform position and attempting to <clears throat> really work out. Um, how he sees these, and and that's fine. I, I have no problem with that. With that said, I and maybe Andrew can uh, can enlighten us on this. But I personally, like you, Rob, have never seen anyone use the argument of the moral, uh, civil, and ceremonial laws being broken up, unless they are trying to say that we don't have to keep them anymore. And and the problem is, so the the, the first the first uh, time anyone ever brought this up to me was in relationship to the kosher laws. However. If I look at the kosher laws, I don't see how these are ceremonial. Are, so is every single meal that, that a person ate under what uh, many would call the, the Mosaic law or the, or the old covenant, if, was, was everything that they ate ceremonial? I mean, clearly, that it, clearly it wasn't. Right. So, so all of a sudden it was a part of life. It was a part of everyday living. It was a part of being steered by God's law. And so, um, I, I would say that this was a moral issue. The other reason it's a moral issue is because there's no punishment for it, right? There's no way to come back from it. It's just a, a breach between you and God. It's something that God doesn't want you to do. And yet you do it anyway. That's a moral issue transgression. It's not anything. It's not a ceremonial transgression. If you do something ceremonially wrong, what happens? You become ceremonially unclean. However, this is not what happens in, in uh, aspects to the kosher laws, right? If, if, if you transgress a kosher law, there is no retribution for it. There's no punishment for it, except for a breach between you and the God that you serve. So that that is not a a uh, ceremonial law. That is a moral law. Yet those who hold to these categories are saying, "Well, we don't have to keep the the kosher laws anymore because they are ceremonial." Well, it's the same with the Sabbath. Clearly, the Sabbath is a civil law. The interesting thing is that uh, those at uh, at Apology Studios who uh, run Cultish, I mean. You know, Jeff Durbin is is a theonomist, right? So he believes that this that and I don't want to speak for I I certainly don't want to speak for for Mr. Durbin and uh, I I wouldn't do that. Um, 
and so I, I can only say what I have understood of other theonomists and how I see theonomy myself, which is that the civil law, quote unquote, in the, if we're going to use this category, God's law should govern all of uh, all nations, right? And will. We see this in Micah 4, right? The, the Torah will go forth and all nations will, will uh, essentially come to the law. So the, the point here is simply that if the Sabbath is a civil law, because it clearly is, right? Somebody, somebody is put to death for breaking it. So that's a civil, uh, civil aspect of the Sabbath. If that is the case, then you have kosher laws and you have the Sabbath laws, which according to the categories should still be kept by Christians today. So these categories aren't even helpful for the people who are attempting to put forth those categories. I think that that's one of the, anyway. Can, do you, do you think, here, here just, you said the kosher laws, just because I've been vocal against this kosher pig, quote, rabbi guy, um, doctor. <laughs> um, yeah, rabbi doctor, the guy who so doesn't do you have believe, a do you, So are you, so one view would say the kosher, you know, pigs were, unclean only for a certain amount of time but in all of history of god eternity past eternity future and the people of god for eternity future pig won't always be unclean that there will be in fact pig will be kosher which is a play to mean like the things that are forbidden will be permitted and all we have to do is come into the messianic era and then all a bunch of things that had been forbidden, even death penalty things, are now permitted. That's one view. There's many who take that view. Others say no, that God's law reflects his eternal character and that the pig will always be inherently tame. It will always be inherently impure. It doesn't matter how much holy water you sprinkle on it. It doesn't matter where we are in the historical timeline. The pig is always an abomination in terms of food for humans. And that that reflects the nature of God's character himself and the nature of how he made humans in his own image. And that is for eternity past, eternity future. So uh, yeah, I, it, I see it, it, that it that it is eternity future, that pigs will always be unclean. So right? it's, I, just, I, I, it's just the nature of it. This is a really interesting uh, thought process here, uh, just how you're presenting it. But I see uh, this in terms of the two times in Scripture that people have said no to God and still lived, like openly, right? God appears to them, tells them to do something. They say no, and God says, instead of God being like, you will do this, he's like, okay, fair enough. Right? And what are they? They're when the prophet is told to uh, cook food over human excrement, and he says, "I will not. It's not kosher." And what does God say? Okay, fine. I'll give you. I'll give you cow dung. And then you have in Acts ten when Peter is to told to rise and eat, kill and eat. Right, and he says, "Surely not, for nothing unkosher has ever touched nothing. Uh, you know, tame has ever touched mm -hmm. my lips." Right, right. And he does that three times. And this is post-resurrection. This, post this is after 40 days and 40 nights of, of Peter learning from the resurrected Yeshua himself. <laughs> right. So, so these, two times, time. these two times are the only two times in Scripture where God appears to someone, tells somebody to do something, they say no, and, they, and they're, they're still alive. They're still, they're still, they live to talk about it, right? And both of them have, well, Jonah, yeah, okay, <laughs> Jonah. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting case because did Jonah die or not, right? Anyway, okay. Uh, there, there are consequences though, right? There are no consequences. There are no consequences for the prophet or for uh, Peter, right? What happens? God says, okay, that's my point. Maybe the maybe the idea of of uh, death is not the right idea. The idea is why no was Dan why was Daniel concerned about what he and his brothers were eating in exile? There's no priesthood. There's no temple. They're not in the land. Why would he Why would he pray towards Jerusalem? There's no temple there. There's no priesthood. 
there's no sacrifices happening. Why does it say it was at the, the praying at the time of the of the afternoon or the evening sacrifice? Yeah. So I mean, ultimately, in my view, that the idea of a of, of a kosher pig is 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 is, a, is stupid. It's idiotic. It's so, idiotic. I, it's it's totally incoherent. The idea that God is going to like change something that was. <laughs> So foundational so, but, to the expression of his character is now going to someday, you know what? I'm just, all that's done away with now. And now we're just got something different going on. Actually, that's like, I, I, I hope that, I hope that uh, Andrew, that's I not know building Andrew, on a rock. Andrew, the, idea, the idea of building up Yeshua says wisdom building on a rock means the, the storms are coming. That rock, that house is going to stay standing. God's not going to take a house that's, that's standing strong and, and, and destroy it. So look, I, here's the thing. I hope that Andrew, that Andrew is still listening because I, I would suggest, uh, to Andrew and to anyone in the, uh, in the online group, uh, pronomen theology, which I run full disclosure. I posted a link in there of a, a, a paper by, uh, doctor, I forget what his name is anyway. Um, and it's on Mark seven. Mark 7, uh, 18 through 19. And uh, it, it's it's a very well put together uh, paper. But I think that people are starting, scholars are starting to come to the realization that the idea that, that Jesus declared all food clean is not going to hold water. We're over time. I've got to go. And so we're going to leave it there. We're going to say... Uh, good discussion. Oh, wow. Yeah, good, good discussion today. Um, so if you would like to be a part of the conversation, please do so. 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. You can also shoot us an email, cheg at torahresource.com, c-h-e-g-g -G at torahresource.com. And yeah, we'll be back next week, Lord willing. We hope that this conversation has done at least one thing, and that is to glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. Why? You know why because Messiah matters. Mm -hmm.